Hi there, welcome everybody. My name's Scott Meyer. It's Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, so this is Drawing Together with Artists Network, where we meet every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern, to draw together. So if you're welcome, I want if you're new, I want to welcome you today. Um, this show is all about us getting together and taking some time out of our busy lives to draw. And the idea behind it is that we choose a new subject each week designed to grow our skills in particular ways. So the, the really the whole objective is that we're trying to really model what healthy artistic practice is. The idea that as artists, we're constantly kind of challenging ourselves and giving ourselves um, these, these projects to work on that we kind of work through with a certain amount of intention so that we keep moving forward. So I'll be talking through my process, but this is really about us drawing together, and I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Any questions you may have, any alternative processes, any comments about the art making process in general. We have viewers from around the world, so feel free to load up the chat. Let us know where you are viewing from, all the familiar names that I see here. Thank you for joining us and, and making this such an awesome show. Uh, so I want to welcome you all back. Uh, let's get right to it. Let's take a look at the subject that we will be working on. So here we have it. It's drawing of the tree. You'll find this reference image in the description below. So you can pull that up and draw along with, or if you'd like to sit back and watch and come back to this later, um, you're welcome to do that. Uh, you can see that in this original one here, my, my preparatory study, it's a little bit smaller. This is sized to about an eight by 10. Uh, and I'm decided, I've decided to work a little bit larger on this version here. This is closer to an 11 by 14. Uh, the image that is linked to below, I believe, is sized to an 8 by 10. What I really want to focus on this one, the challenge that this subject presents us with is how to manage the complexity of the trees here. The, there, there's so many leaves and branches, all of that stuff, how do we simplify and make this an effective drawing that captures the spirit of the tree, the essence of it, without getting overwhelmed by all the leaves? I'll walk through my process, and, and again, as, as with many of the subjects throughout this whole series, it's about putting you in control over how expressive you want to be or how controlled and detailed you want to be. It's all about making a set of decisions that, that puts you on the path towards your end goal. And the clearer you are with yourself about where your end goal is, the, the, the more focused your attention will be um, and you'll grow more quickly that way. So as we move into it, really try to identify for yourself how much detail do you really want. Right? How little detail, how expressive do you want it to be? Do you want it to really mirror the reference image exactly, or do you want it to be the reference image to really just be a jumping off point? If you can have at least a rough idea about some of those things going into it, it'll help you to know when you're done with the drawing, whether you've met your objectives, and whether or not you've really grown in a way that's, uh, that's really right for you. So welcome, everybody. If you do have any questions and you, and, um, and you would like me to get to them, if you type them in all caps, it's a little bit easier for me to see. So I will do my best to address them. And if I happen to miss a question, please ask it again, because sometimes the chat gets going and I miss some things. All right. So let's get to it. Um, materials. This is the Somerset rag. I kind of changed it at the last minute. I like the Reeves BFK as well, but I decided to work on the Somerset rag. Um, I feel like there's a little bit of an indentation over here, but we'll we'll deal with that. All right, for graphite, um, I think this this uh, project would work really well in charcoal also, but I chose to work in graphite. Um, I have a 4B kind of soft stick that I'll be using for my gesture. Uh, I have a I have a B, a 2B, and an 8B uh, here for my range of uh, values with the pencils. I have a bias towards the softer graphite. Uh, the goal here, though, or the, the, really the um, the priority that I place on it is just having a range of them. I don't get too um, kind of focus on having a precise pencil. I just want to have at least a range that I can work with. Uh, for the erasers, I have a new re needed eraser. Finally, it's a tiny one, but it works really well. Uh, and I have my Derwent retractable eraser as well. Again, it's carved down with a razor blade to give me that chisel tip, and it gives me uh, all the control that I need. Uh, and then finally for blending, I just have my paper towel and I have my tortillon right here. So 
there you have it. Let's get to it. Um, we got people all over the place. Thank you all for joining us. We got people, Buenos Aires. We've got Ireland, Canada, several people from Canada, Liverpool, New York. Um, I, I imagine that's beautiful there as well. So um, well, I hope everybody's doing well. This tree it, it brings a smile to my face. I, I love the character of the tree. And in particular, what I liked about the photographer, you'll see the, the credit for the photographer in the description below, so check that out. Um, but that I love the scale of the figure next to the tree. That, that makes so much of the character of the tree really clear. Um, and yeah, I think it was a great choice. So let's get to it. If you are working with charcoal, um, you might start with vine charcoal here as we establish the gesture. I'm, gesture. I'm going to use the side of my pencil here. Um, I've got the small thumbnail up in front of me here that I'm mostly going to be working from. Um, and I have the larger scale reference up here to my left. And I'm going to try to just think about the, the basic form of the tree. And it's a very light pressure here. This isn't about accuracy. This is just about taking some time to connect with the materials, to connect with the subject get information on the page uh, kind of quickly without thinking too much about it. I'm going to dig into those edges there. Uh, I want to get a little bit of tone on the sky as well. What I like about working with a softer graphite or vine charcoal in this stage is that it helps to apply a light tone to that surface uh, that will make subsequent layers of graphite more receptive to that surface surface. And if you're working with charcoal, a layer of vine charcoal works wonders for compressed charcoal that might go on top. Actually I'll build up some some tone here on the surface here for where the sky might be. See there's a, a little blemish here on the paper. That's all right. We'll we'll deal with that and we'll manage that later. Uh, and I prefer my gestures to be really, um, really geared toward focusing on shape rather than line. And if, especially for something like this, this really kind of loose, abstract, organic form of the tree, I feel like working with shape is going to ultimately kind of help me out more than if I were to try to find a contour line for the tree. And so as I squint my eyes, blur my vision, I'm simply reacting to that form. And, and I, I think it's also really helpful to try to not think about the subject as a tree at this stage. We talk about that a lot in this series, the idea that, you know, sometimes when we identify an object and we label it, it pops into our head all the preconceived notions about what it should look like, well, how we should draw it based on previous drawing experiences, all of those things, and we stop looking at the particular qualities of this subject in front of us. I'm gonna take my paper towel, just with a light pressure, circular motion, start to smooth this out. We're hitting that ugly duckling stage pretty early in this drawing. Something we haven't talked about in a while, but I've come to accept the fact that pretty much every drawing goes through the ugly duckling stage. The idea that you start to get a little worried about whether or not it's actually gonna come out all right. You just gotta power through it. Um, every drawing that I've worked on, you know, goes through that at, at some point. Uh, and that gets exciting for me. Um, okay. Now at this stage also, I'm, even though I'm building up tone, I'm not thinking about accurate values. I am just simply looking at kind of big decisions. Uh, and, and those decisions could be, you know, is the sky lighter or darker than the tree? Is it lighter or darker than the ground? 
you know, et cetera, making those just basic observations, not asking how much lighter is it or how much darker is it, but just is it lighter or darker and trying to establish those relationships. And then as it starts to come together, then we can adjust them from there. So now I want to kind of smooth out that sky a little bit. Some techniques for smoothing out the area. I'm just using a very light pressure with the material. And where I notice a light spot, I'll work on filling that in. I'll kind of tighten up the marks a little bit, start to blend it in, and kind of wash over it. Uh, I have to, the way the lights are set up in here, I'm getting quite a bit of glare off of the surface here. So I'm actually working from the overhead projection more, from the same view that you are seeing. Uh, so it's something to be aware of. And, and I notice, especially with graphite, because it is a more reflective material, um, kind of changing my relationship to the surface can make a big difference in how I observe certain you know, issues with the drawing. So before I, you know, before I lift any of these dark spots, I see, see some of these areas that, are, that look too dark. Before I lift them, what I do is I try to fill in all the light areas that I see. And if I were working in charcoal, I would still be working with the vine charcoal for this as well. And I'm just using the palm of my hand to blend, mostly because it's easier, even though I have my paper towel in my left hand. Um, just switching is kind of a pain. <laughs> so it's starting to smooth out a little bit. And I like this kind of more meditative process early on in the drawing. You know, I'll still work this, um, the, these gradients and these these flat values in the sky, uh, you know, throughout the drawing. But this is something that I can work on now. That my my brain's not really f as focused on drawing and on the subject as it will be as I continue to move through the drawing. So that's it's something to think about as well. Is I know there was a time in my own practice where I would put a lot of pressure on myself to have a thorough understanding of the subject before I even started the drawing, right? It's the idea that, you know, I would I'd recognize the tree, I'd look at it, I'd take a quick glance, and then I would look down on my paper and keep working and working and working without ever really looking back at the subject. I would just be working from that quick snapshot that I had taken very early on, uh, and I really had to break that habit. Uh, and a lot of that is because I would put so much pressure on myself to make it look right, but I wasn't giving myself the tools that I needed to to make it look right. Um, and the idea that, you know, it takes time to really deconstruct all the visual information that is being given to us by the subject, whether you're working from life or from a photograph. All that information um, gets processed really quickly by the brain and it's often not very useful for us to know how we know we're looking at a tree, right? We, our brain solves a bunch of stuff for us. It sends to our conscious mind, oh, here's that tree. Now, what's useful is probably, you know, what are we going to do with that tree? How are we going to interact with it? How does it feel? Those types of things. We, it, often what's not useful for us is what does it look like? And how do we know what it looks like? Uh, so drawing, painting, and really studying the subject uh, is uh, just kind of deconstructs that that whole process in the brain. All right, so dark areas like this, I'm going to take my kneaded eraser and just kind of gently tap along there. Start to lift it. And it's slowly going away. But I, again, I'll have to ask myself, like, what is my threshold for perfection in this? And in general, I have a fairly low threshold for perfection. Um, you know, some days I feel more 
kind of in tune with that part of me that wants to make everything just right, just perfect. Um, some days I'm more open, or I guess more more days than not, I'm I, I'm excited to see. Well, what does what's going to happen somewhat randomly throughout the process that I can utilize for my drawing? What kind of discoveries can I make? Um, going back to that original idea that I was just talking about, though, is that you know we're we're using the drawing process as a way to understand the subject. So the the more we draw, the more we use the drawing process to study, the better we understand the subject. The better we understand the subject, the better our drawings would be. So it creates this feedback loop. Um, there's a bit of a shadow that comes in from this light behind me here. All right. I am going to establish another quick gesture on top of this. And I'm going to be a little bit slower. Actually, what I think I want to do is try to map the overall shape of the tree a little bit more. And I want to be really gentle with the marks here because some of these linear marks that I'm going to make could show up uh, in later stages if I'm not able to blend it with the rest of the drawing or, uh, or erase it out. So I'm going to try to try to see the complex form of this tree as a sim as a simple shape. Uh, one of the things that we'll have to address are the sky holes. The sky holes are the little holes that we see through the branches. At this stage, I'm not thinking about it a whole lot. I'm just thinking about basic shape, and we'll kind of carve into this basic shape uh, to achieve a greater degree of specificity in the form. So again, the, one of the primary objectives for this project is to help us address these complex objects. You know, what do we do when we have all of these leaves? And the primary tool we're going to try to leverage in this is the viewer's natural inclination to fill in missing information. So we're going to be magicians a little bit. So looking, at, looking across the form can be really helpful in seeing the overall shape of the tree. So using plumb lines and horizontal guides. So for example, there's this branch that sticks out using a plumb line can help you to evaluate what its relationship is relative to this leftmost point on the top part of the tree. And we have this other branch down in here. Uh, another thing that can be helpful at this early stage, and it'll be helpful throughout the whole drawing, is to start to think about the negative space as well. So if we look at the tree as positive space, the negative space becomes this lighter shape created in that sky. Try to kind of flip back and forth between observing the shape of the tree and then observing the shape of the sky. And they will, in each mode, you will be given new information about the tree that will hopefully be useful. Now, I've also mostly been using kind of an angle sighting. So as I look at the shape, I'm trying to compare this angle here to the reference image, carrying them one to one from the reference image to the tape paper. And um, now, and then I'm going to start to apply some measuring as well. If you're using charcoal, it can be really helpful at this stage to um, keep working with the graphite, I'm sorry, with the vine charcoal. All right, so I had roughed in the, the trunk of the tree here, but I can, I can orient it to this point in the tree over here. It's directly below it is where the trunk of the tree originates. 
look for the angle. I think I got the angle largely correct here. I'm not going to get sucked into all the nuances, any sort of detail of the tree, just looking for that overall shape. And with the kneaded eraser, I'm just going to try to tap first to see what it does, see how much of the material releases. Not much. There we go. I just got to lean in on it a little bit more. Uh, I can also kind of look for that overall shadow shape that runs right off the edge of the paper. And then there is a hill line that we want to establish. Now that's going to be kind of a tricky one as well. Very subtle value relationships there. So how's everybody's drawing coming along? If, if, you're, if you're following along, anybody thoroughly overwhelmed? Need help simplifying? I think a big thing is to try not to get overwhelmed. Uh, and again, the another big thing is to identify what your threshold for accuracy is. One of the things I love working about working with natural objects in the landscape is that being organic, it's a little bit more forgiving with regards to that accuracy. I can be off by more and I can focus more on the impression of the objects rather than an explicit description. All right, so I'll end up having to smooth out that sky a little bit more. And sometimes I don't like to smooth out the sky because it, it can give a bit, a bit more kind of atmosphere and weight to the sky to have some variation in it. Um, <laughs> Minakashi, I will, I will try to work faster. <laughs> um, I'll do what I can. Um, let's see. Hello from New York City, everybody. Let's see. Yeah, Edie, yeah, there's definitely too many to go one, to, one by one. Uh, now Art says, love to draw flowers and trees. That's awesome. Yeah, I did. My, my senior thesis when my undergrad was a series of white pines around Baltimore that reminded me of the trees back in Maine and, um, I, they were essentially tree portraits for me, and I really enjoyed that. Um, so this brings back a lot of fond memories of those experiences. Okay, so now what do we want to do? Next stage, I want to add a little bit of weight to the bottom, a little more substance here. So I'm going to add some more of the graphite. And try to find the edge of that hillside. Uh, let's see. Minakshi's uh, comment about working faster kind of brings up a, kind of a, a good point to consider too. Is that I know there was a time in my practice where the speed at which I drew was a thing for me. And I, it took me a lot of time to break that habit. I naturally work more quickly than, than, than the average. Um, and for some things that was a helpful quality and others, um, I found it more f just leading to frustration. I would always admire the, my classmates who could really sit with a subject and study it and analyze it, and I would just want to be on to the next one. Um, so I just want to say, you know, the it's part of discovering who you are as an artist is discovering your speed of thought uh, with regards to your materials, and 
finding the materials that allow you to really express those thoughts at the speed at which you have them. So I, the term I use is working at the speed of thought. Um, and, you know, with my, many of these drawing media, I, I'm able to express my observations pretty much in real time without having to really labor on them and set the, you know, set a, a tone for it or set the groundwork. Um, and there are some mediums like, you know, colored pencil I find more challenging because it's a slower medium and I, I want to be able to work faster. Um, and so I'm going to be, I continue to practice with colored pencil to see if I can get it to work the way I want to, but, um, just kind of something that I like to contemplate is what is my relationship to the medium and, and in a way that describes the, uh, the way I process information, um, <laughs> if you stop right there, you have the silhouette of, uh, of a crouching prehistoric reptile. That's awesome. I like I like the uh, I like the idea that we can kind of project into it a, a number of things. <laughs> That's what's cool about you know art is that you know it's all a matter of interpretation. We're all interpreting form. Um, I don't know why I'm kind of messing with the background so much, but I'm using my kneaded eraser very lightly. You can see I'm actually um, resisting some of the weight with the um, with my fingers. So I'm resting my fingers on the, the surface. What I want to do now is kind of refine this shape. And I'm going to start by kind of subtracting out the back of the back side of here. Uh, and I want to be careful not to lift too much. I don't want to make this halo around the tree that's very bright. So I'm just using these soft circular marks, just using the weight of the eraser. And I'm intentionally using the smaller thumbnail to draw from, the one that's on the screen in front of me, because then it, it, it helps me to overcome the desire to look at all those fine details, all of those all those leaves that are just sitting right there waiting to be drawn. Sarah Kate's Art, welcome. I don't recognize your name before, so if you're new, I want to welcome you. Um, and as I said at the top of the show here, this is an open forum to share ideas and approaches, comments, questions, observations about drawing. I kind of talk through my process, but what's great about drawing is that we each find our own way to navigate the process. Um, so the more we share, the better. So again, now I'm, I'm still looking more at the negative space, trying to see the shape of that tree. Uh, and uh, the kneaded eraser is helpful because it being softer, um, it, again, it, it kind of encourages me to focus on larger form and rather than um, really kind of the refinement or detail. One of the things we'll also have to confront in this drawing is the value relationship between the light on the trees and that blue sky. So we see that sky gradation uh, where it's a little bit lighter, a little bit um, less saturated at the horizon. And as we move up, it, it kind of shifts through various um, temperature changes and value shifts as we move from the ground plane up, moving to this more saturated kind of cooler blue up into this richer, um, more violet. Uh, you start to see that that shift. When I'm painting outside, I use a, um, I use a turquoise and a magenta to mix together to create these blues and 
and adjust the relationship between tur turquoise and magenta with more magenta at the top, more, more turqu turquoise towards the bottom, and then a more neutral uh, hue down at the bottom. Um, one of the challenges that sky gradations present us with is interpreting the value of a band of the sky uh, as compared to its saturation. Um, it's often a bit more saturated slightly above the horizon, so we, we see a, a shift in, it looks like value, sometimes it feels like it's lighter in value here, a little bit darker, but it's often more saturated and less saturated, so they can be very similar in value. Um, and we notice that shift when we're able to see in color, but when we're drawing, uh, sometimes we need to kind of fake that a little bit and indicate that shift using value shift rather than hue or saturation. Back up to here. Again, looking at some of the negative space in the sky holes here. Uh, and as, as I'm going through, I'm kind of identifying that I want to be, you know, if I can get about an 80% accuracy for this tree, I think I'll be happy. Uh, and and again, I call that out because what that can do when you've, once you've kind of given yourself a direction with regards to that, that little voice pops up in your head and says, oh, I need to either keep addressing a certain area or I can let it go. Uh, and again, sometimes if you don't have that clarified going into a drawing, if you're not sure how accurate you need to be to be satisfied. You get to this point and you, you, you kind of start to, to flail and you start kind of correcting in some areas and letting some areas go by and kind of reacting to it. Um, but with less kind of intention behind it. And, and I think in general what I look to do is if I, if I want to have about 80% accuracy across the, the drawing, I might have some areas that are less um, finished and maybe about 70% finished and then another other areas that are closer to 90 or 100% where you're really digging in and so there's some, some variety there. To help smooth out this area, I'm going to use these circular motions with a kneaded eraser. Now, I, I talk about this too, as I, I get a little claustrophobic thinking about trying to protect areas of a drawing, so I don't. Um, I'm not super careful with it. I've just come to expect that certain things are going to have to be redrawn. Uh, again, that's another thing that you might uh, want to identify, you know, as you go in into the drawing. If you do need to protect a certain area because it just makes you feel uncomfortable to work on an area and then have it um, you just kind of disappear because your hand's resting on it. Um, you might get like a, a some sort of bridge, a mall stick, a um, you know sheet of parchment paper, something that might sit on top of the drawing. Now, as you're going through and you're looking at the negative space, continue to make check-ins uh, with the rest of the form. So, for example, if I'm over on this side of the drawing here and I'm observing the specific shape. Uh, of that negative space, I'm going to do a quick horizontal check-in to see where I am relative to other forms in the tree. I'll do some plumb lines here, evaluating, you know, how I'm stacking these observations on top of one another.
All right. So now we have a, a higher degree of, of precision and refinement to the shape, but we, of course, we've still got a long way to go. Um, and what I need to focus on as I build the form of the tree now will be the light and shadow. Uh, it's something that is easy to get lost in when you're drawing something like a tree. Uh, but the more you can see the shape of light, the shape of shadow on the tree, where is the light hitting it more than others, the better. And I say that because that's the key to kind of activating the part in the viewer that fills in the missing information and fills in that texture. If you get the shading right, it goes a long way to suggesting, you know, whether there are leaves or whether it's a shiny object, whether it's really rough, uh, etc. So um, the, now my shift is really going to be on that. Uh, and I, what I like is that I've got this background area that provides a bit of an escape hatch for me and that I can just kind of mess around in, in these areas while I kind of regroup and clean up my thoughts a little bit. Um, <laughs> Carol, yours says yours looks like a T-Rex. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I could see taking these and making them, I don't know, any, any number of things. So, um, uh, Heather is saying, I know most of the time drawing with you, Scott, I, that I often get ahead of you in the beginning. I start really getting into the meat of it, and before I know it, you've gotten way ahead of me. Oh, that's an interesting observation. So I think, you know, if I can break down the steps of a drawing into four, four to five main steps, really, really any subject. For me, it starts with a gesture. It moves into correcting the main form. Then you start to refine the shapes, just like I'm doing here. And then you start to, to build in the details. That third step of refining the shapes can often, you know, if you spend more time on that, you can often then move through the finishing stages more quickly. And then, and by the same token, if you're able to kind of stick with the measuring early on, that can save you time in the end as well. Um, but we all kind of reorganize those steps in different ways. Some people do measuring ahead of time. Some people skip the gesture altogether. Some people jump right into detail. Uh, this is just my way of working. And I found that it, um, it helps me approach any subject so that I'm not thinking about drawing a tree as fundamentally different than drawing a portrait, right? It's all, it's all a very similar process. And, and each then subject gives me uh, the excitement of learning something new, right? Discovering something new about that subject. Because I don't have to think about the process of steps I'm going to take. Uh, I just need to, I can really focus on the shape, the values of relationships between the forms and that subject, the things that make it, it unique. Okay. Let, uh, what am I going to do now? I'm going to pull out my pencils. I'll start with the B. And I'm going to ref refine some of the shape now from the positive space. Using the side of the pencil, I'm going to block in some of these forms here. Now, I, well, let me, I, di the direction of marks can be really important sometimes. So I I don't really I don't really know what I'm what I'm thinking as I make these marks here, but I am using the side of the pencil here. And I think what I'm ultimately looking for are where the shapes become more distinct. And I'm just playing around with the direction of the marks to see what happens. I think the tooth of the paper itself is going to be. Um, really valuable in conveying the, the texture of the leaves. And I'm not really drawing the branches a whole lot, but where I can see a 
You know, I can, I, when I can see a, a main shape, I might put that in there. So I'm using this overhand grip intentionally here. Um, it helps me to um, really engage the side of the pencil more. If I need to, I think I can, I think I can hit that, that background, that negative space a little bit more in some areas where, where I missed. And I'm going to, I think, generally prioritize these circular motions. Make them somewhat omnidirectional. There is this kind of cluster here. Now, uh, as I'm making this pass here in the, in the tree and refining the shapes, I'm also trying to make observations about the uh, light and shadow structure, just taking mental notes about which parts of the tree seem to be catching the light and which seem to be in shadow. Uh, I'm also trying to be careful to allow the, the pencil to roll in my fingers a bit. Uh, and that helps to round the, the core of the pencil a bit more so I don't develop flat spots there. need to keep looking at the thumbnail. Because it's so small and far away from me, it, I don't really need to be squinting my eyes. Um, but you, you may find it helpful to squint at this point. And there are definitely some branches that feel like they uh, really blend in with that sky. Um, Now, one of the great things about drawing trees is observing the gesture of the branches and the leaves. There's such a gestural quality to them. And what I've found is that by focusing on that gesture, uh, and just, you know, is it an upward swoop? Is it, a, is it sl you know, slumping downward? You know, is it is it a more rigid form or uh, you know looser? You know th that you can really express the quality of the tree just through the gesture. Uh, and all trees are so very different from one another. So again, as I'm, I'm just making this pass here, refining that shape. And as I get to the edges, you see I'm not really utilizing a line. Uh, and I'm not getting caught up in really the precise um, shapes of leaves in there. So um, I think I need to shift this branch over. So that means this can all come up here, value. So I'm leaving the, letting the, the edges kind of be what they are at this point. I'm, I, again, I'm not really getting hung up on them. Uh, I'll come up here and When I'm encountering a branch, I'm going to do my best to try to treat it as a shape, not as lines.
So if I see this vertical branch, for example, I'll try to create it as a series of horizontal um, passes with the pencil. Uh, now there's a bit of the kind of negative space in here. And again, just the tooth of the paper goes a long way in suggesting some of the, te the texture of the leaves, especially at the edges where there seems to be more of a diffused quality to the shapes. Uh, so, and I you know, mentioned earlier that I'm trying to make observations about where the light is striking the tree, where it's in shadow, but I'm not really making statements about it yet. I'm treating this shape as a solid value for the most part. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll come back later with a darker graphite to refine the shadow shape. So we're thinking just major shapes now and then moving into gradually smaller shapes. Um, Uh, Nia is asking, would I consider teaching longer painting tutorials or other various art mediums on Patreon? Uh, so I will actually be moving in that direction here with Artist Network, creating tutorials for watercolor, oils, pastels. Um, we're in the midst of, of kind of figuring out our programming here, uh, and but that is the kind of the goal, and it may change the format up, but my uh, the ultimate goal is to try to be able to deliver more content than the once a week live session that we have uh, and expand into uh, and into other media, uh, particularly oil painting, which is more of my wheelhouse. Uh, but I'm really excited to learn more about watercolor. Uh, so that'll be a fun kind of experiment. Um, and I also want to create content that is um, that really spans and covers a, the issues of a, a composition, color theory, and other principles of design and what goes into making art. So, yes, the goal will be to make more. Um, we, we just got to figure out the right programming schedule and. So I appreciate all the feedback, um, and I want to do what I can to to provide what I can, because teaching is what I love to do the most. I kind of like the way this is silhouetted at this stage. I'm, <laughs> uh, and this is, again, one of the, the strengths that I see in this way of working, of building up as a whole. It, um, it, it puts you in the position of reacting to the drawing, reacting to the artwork. And I don't know if you've ever heard other artists say that, but it's a it's a pretty common thing that I you know I hear artists say is that you know just responding to what the painting or the drawing is giving me. Um, and and this is kind of a good example of it. You know, moving through the process that you know I had you know roughly intended, but there are some things that you can't really predict how it's going to turn out. So as I'm going through each of these stages, I'm seeing things happening on the page that I hadn't really envisioned before I started. And I, I really like what's happening. So I could pivot around this idea of maybe making this more of a silhouette. Um, but we'll, we'll see. Um, I think I do want to get into building that structure because I think it'll be ultimately more valuable. I can always come back and do another version of this if I want to. Um, going back to Nia's comment there, I one of the things I'm also working on is uh, I'll be kind of practicing more with colored pencil. Um, it's a medium that confounds me. <laughs> Again, because it, 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 I don't work at that pace. It's a, it's a much slower pace than my, my pace of thought as I'm creating, typically, or what I've habituated myself to. So I need to break some habits in order to, really work with it effectively, and that can be a hard thing to do. Uh, 
Um, this, this whole area here is, is just a fun spot with these branches. So what do I want to do? I want to first think about this kind of negative space under here, this moss that seems to be growing up. I'm assuming this is an oak tree. Um, I feel like I should know that with some greater clarity, but um, there's moss growing on this tree that I think is amazing. Uh, now, with this trunk, I'm not going to really refine this a whole lot either, right? There's a lot more we can do it with it, but right now I want to get back to refining the ultimate shape of the tree because um, I'm, you know, there, I'm going to gather more information there. If I get stuck here, it'll put me out of sync with the rest of the drawing. I'll be kind of finished in one area and, you know, still gestural in others. Uh, and... And, and that, that brings up the point that I also wanted to make, the idea that, you know, consider that all drawing is gesture drawing. That's the kind of the mantra that I've been playing with lately uh, as I contemplate what's useful. And uh, I, especially with a tree, you know, even the small marks can be gestural and that they describe some quality of the tree, whether it's the the direction of the leaves or the branches, um, you know, whether there's a there's movement in the because of the wind, things like that. That um, you know, all all marks can be gestural, and and uh, and I like to have that. I like to contemplate what that means, and to see if that's true. Because sometimes I'll I'll kind of progress with an idea that I I'm going to test out. And then over time, I may say, you know, I wasn't, that wasn't really helpful at all um, or it wasn't true. But the thing that I'm kind of playing with is that idea of marks being gestures. How can I make every mark to some degree a statement about something? So you can see I was working with some of the negative space there. Um, I needed to kind of connect the dots through these shapes. Um, and really try to, again, keep in mind where you are relative to some of these other forms. Some of these areas here where it gets really complex, I'm just creating an irregular shape with the kneaded eraser and letting it do its thing. I'm just kind of letting it dance across the surface to create these irregular forms. And if I'm in the right sp spot and generally moving in the right direction, it's going to convey a sufficient amount of information for it to be accepted by the viewer. And there are just these areas that really seem broken up. And it's overwhelming to try to deconstruct that and observe all these specific individual shapes. Instead, I'm just looking for that region to try to identify what kind of direction and size these irregular marks might be. All right, back here. If you haven't stepped back from your work, it can be really helpful to do that. Um, looking at your work from a distance, you know, it can really help you to adjust sort of perspective distortions, uh, see any sort of glaring opportunities in your work. Um, uh, I see. I see a lot of comments about colored pencils. So, um, oh, let's go. Yeah. Oh, the comment about it being struck by lightning—that would be pretty wild. Um, Stella, I think I'm still a beginner, and when I paint something, I struggle to paint it again because I can't see further than my first painting. Then my brain gets tired. That's a very real thing, brain fatigue. It's a lot of mental activity happening with the, with the brain. And w what you're talking about, too, I've always equated to muscle memory, or that, that at least that playing a role. So that might be one thing that you consider if you find yourself creating a painting 
and then creating another one with the intention of it becoming, you know, more refined or, or you know, stronger in some way. Uh, the one of the things that we have to confront is that muscle memory. Now that we've created that first one, it's easier for our brain to access what we've already created, and um, and we have to sometimes fight that. What you might consider doing then is um, painting directly on top of the old one, the first one, rather than create a second version. That may be what you're already doing, but um, I I will often, if I if I need to correct something in a drawing or painting, I'll find the correct shape or color first, and then paint out the original version that um, was less accurate. Uh, and that way, it prevents me from repeating it because I've done that so many times where I'll make a mark and I'm like, I don't really like it, so I'll erase it and I'll do it again and I'll do the exact same mark. And now I've got, I've got two opportunities for my muscle memory to build up and I've got to fight that even more. So I said I kind of keep the old one on there and I keep going until I find the correct mark, then I erase out the other ones. Um, and at least that's that's what's kind of worked for me, but we'll see how, see what works for you. Uh, and then it also kind of throwing off your process, you know, ask yourself if you are repeating the same steps, if you're moving through the, the, the painting in the same, in the same process, that could be a challenge as well. Um, you see, I haven't drawn the figure in there yet, and I will get to it. I do want to, in some way, suggest the pasture here. Can I clarify that? I want to limit. I want to clear up some of the the muddiness. And as I get up to the tree, I'm just going to kind of tap around that rather than really scrub it. Uh, and I, I think one of the things that could be you know, may not work for you is in, in where I need to be mindful is that I really enjoy the fight of a drawing or a painting um, where I, I feel like the whole thing is just going to crumble. I get, I get excited by that, um, but that may not be your cup of tea. So um, just kind of put that out there. If <laughs> You'll find your own way through it um, and own that. Um, you know, you're going to try on the things that you observe by other artists as you discover them and say, well, how does, how does this process work? Would I like that? Um, but you're, you're going to find your own way. All right, let's see. So yeah, I, I think that now that overall shape of the tree is refined thoroughly, this ground plane is distracting me. So I want to give a little bit more attention to that. Just kind of smooth things out because I haven't done much work there. Again, kind of targeting the, the light areas. I'm going to try to smooth it. Not, I don't have to be super smooth with it because uh, you've got that texture of the grass and we'll address that later on. But I feel like this is kind of calling for a vignette a little bit, so I'll darken this corner. Just briefly looking for my paper towel that was in my hand. That's always fun. All right, I kind of like... So that's a mark right there that I didn't intend, but I like what's happening to it. So what I'll do is actually, when, as I work on that ground plane, I'll lift a little bit more light here. And 
and I can kind of smooth this out a little bit so that I have a little bit of contrast. And I this I think the kneaded eraser was the non-optimal tool. So I'm just using the flat side of this kneaded eraser in these short kind of vibrations to lift off some of that light there. And that hillside, we can just be kind of atmospheric with it all. I'm going to go right over that edge of the tree. And I kind of like how this gets all kind of washed together. Uh, what I what I love about drawing too is that you can be incredibly subtle. The um, you know the viewers our, our brains are really really adept at observing subtle value shifts, and we often will feel the the urge to make things more explicit than they need to be. All right, so. Um, Let's see. Okay. Let's build in some uh, some shadow here in the tree. Just that hillside. So I'll move through. That's not the right pencil. Let me put that aside. Was I just using the B? Does this get darker? Yeah, I'll use the 2B. A little bit darker now. So what I want to observe now are the shapes of light and shadow. Uh, and there are kind of two scales of observation that you can make here. There's the, the whole tree as a whole, light is coming in from this side, this side is largely in shadow. But you're also going to notice that there are these clumps of the, in these branches that each have their own light side and shadow side. Uh, and I'm going to largely focus on those clumps, but I want to also see, um, I want to make sure I don't lose sight of the whole of the drawing of the tree there. Uh, and I find that this, it's more helpful to use a smaller reference image in this, at this stage. I've got the larger one and I've got the smaller one. And what happens with the larger one is the detail becomes overwhelming. And when you're focused on detail, one of the things your brain ignores is light and shadow and value relationships. All right? You get clarity of those forms. Everything comes into sharp focus, but it gets harder to see the larger shapes of light and dark. And so by squinting, it helps to see that. And also by reducing the size of your image, it will help you to see just those larger shapes. So there are some in here, some of these shapes in here are, are darker uh, than um, some other areas. And I can go even darker later on, but I first want to just find these, these larger shapes of light and dark. There's some areas where, you know, we're, there, where we're, what we're looking at is a form shadow, some areas we're looking at cast shadows. And if you take the time to break that down and really analyze the subject that way, it can be somewhat helpful, but um, that's overwhelming for me, so I'm not doing that. And if, you're, if you're not familiar with those, those terms, what I'm talking about is, you know, where when you're dealing with the shaded side of a form, that's the form shadow. So you have a light side and a shadow side. That object will also cast a shadow onto the surface. And some of these, what we're seeing are these shadows that are cast by other branches, and some of them are the forms um, just the opposite side of where the light is striking a cluster of leaves. And um, I 
so kind of through here, there are some darker spots. And I'm not spending a whole lot of time really analyzing the specific shape as I see these dark spots, but um, I'm just kind of reacting more gesturally than anything. Here is a nice dark pass here. This whole sec center section here is largely in shadow. Um, so you may see me modulating my eyes. I'm just I'm opening them wide, letting my vision blur flooding them with light and I'm squinting and then I'm just letting them lose focus. And I think how, you know, the, between those three kind of modes of observing and modulating the eyes, you start to discover things about the, about the subject that you can apply to the drawing. Um, you know, about where, you know, looking for things where, like where edges disappear if you're looking at a form and it looks clear when you're observing it, when you're when you're looking at it with sharp focus, um, and it then it disappears, the edge disappears when you blur your vision, then it's an indication that the values are closer together than you might have realized. Um, yeah, here along this branch, uh, it, it, we could start to see a kind of a positive and negative spatial relationship. So we see this section here that's in shadow, and if I treat that as a negative space, this shape here, where it's a little bit lighter, becomes a positive space that projects forward. So we can start to observe those positive and negative spatial relationships as well. So we're getting there. Hope, hopefully this is showing up okay. Um, and if, if anybody has any questions, observations, thoughts in general, so let, let me know. Invite your friends. If you're new, I just want to welcome you. This is Drawing Together. My name's Scott with Artist Network. Um, my book's coming out soon. Keep forgetting to mention that. So June 7th is when it comes out in print. Right now it's available for pre-order. And the book is called See, Think, Draw. And that's available on Amazon. And it, it, it is really built on these processes. The idea that you, you, know, you, you learn concepts for drawing best when, you, when you're creating drawings with intention. You're choosing subjects that, uh, that will help you grow, specific subjects that help you grow in particular ways, right? So, you know, drawing a house to help understand perspective. Um, because that's what happens when we, when we learn. You might take a class on, and maybe you learn perspective, but you'll really internalize it and you'll continue to learn it with greater depth and clarity through continued practice and you know, choosing of the right subjects to help push you in that direction. So it's the practice that ultimately, ultimately gets you going. And then that is the habit that you build is, um, is to challenge yourself. So I... I you know, I tell people that I think one of the last things I want is a, a drawing that I'm 100% happy with or a painting I'm 100% happy with. Right. It's, it's that thing that I see in my work that I could have done better that, um, that gets me excited to do the next one, <laughs> right? Or, uh, you know, whether it's 
subject matter, composition, or color, or what whatnot. I think if you can define what what you're doing well and what you'd like to push further with each image, you can really build a healthy practice. So right in here, uh, doing some negative drawing, I'm seeing some of the, sh the darker shapes and kind of stopping short where I see the, uh, the lighter branch coming in front. Uh, and then there's a darker branch coming in here. That I might need to lift out a little bit on this side to reveal. And so here again, we have that negative space with that shadow, the positive space where that's being struck by light. And then this is shadow under here. So by observing the shapes of light and dark, um, this is the stage in your observations where you can really engage with the structure of the tree. And perhaps it's revealing to you something that you know, your first observation may not have. And again, as I said at the, the start of the show that, you know, that's really what the drawing process is about for me. It's using the using drawing to help me to understand the subject, and the more I understand the subject, the better the drawing is going to be. So the drawing is evolving at the same rate at which my observations are. Um, so there's, a, there's an aspect to the, the process in which I, I have to acknowledge that I know very little about what I'm looking at. And it doesn't matter how many times I've drawn trees, how many trees I've looked at, I'm going to start with the mindset that this could be an entirely new experience. And the, the particular qualities of this tree are going to be revealed throughout the drawing process. And it's going to be ev an evidence of the, the discoveries that I'm making along the way. That's what the drawing becomes. It's, it's revealing the process of its own creation. And that's, that's something that I think is really unique in, in art as, as opposed to other, uh, other art forms, you know, where we often see the final result of all the work. Um, one of the potentials that art can provide is the, the ability to reveal its own creation um, and the, the steps along the way. You can reveal some of the early stages and you can show the, the corrections and the adjustments and the layers and things like that that are often difficult. You know, in music, for example, we often hear the final piece. Not, and that, that may not include accidents and trying around, trying out different themes and riffs, stuff like that. And that, in particular, is what I love most about drawing is that it has such a direct connection to an artist's mind. There's so little barrier between thought and execution. Uh, when you see the drawings of a master artist or you know, the cave paintings in Lascaux, you have nearly direct access to the mind that created those marks. Okay, now where, where am I? All right, now I think what I'll do is uh, with this, my this is my 2B, yeah, my 2B pencil, I can start to refine uh, the, the trunk of the tree here. Uh, and one of the things that I, I think is, is important to look for are, and identify are areas where you need refinement and areas where you can let things go. You don't need to refine them even farther. You know, I think the trunk is something that I really want to refine farther, uh, but I can let some other areas become, and remain kind of soft and diffused. Now, when I create these branches, I'm going to really 
pretty much use the side of my pencil to create that. And what I found is that that often leads to a more natural looking mark than when I switch to a, say a tripod grip and I draw a line like this. Um, and that's, uh, I think, more just my own, my own thing, what I, um, what's, what works for me. So it may not be what works for you, but compare the difference between making a mark using the side of the pencil or, or the length of the pencil like this um, to using the, using the tip of the pencil and a tripod grip. Uh, and now, so as I'm looking at the, the trunk here, I'm looking at the shapes of light and dark. And you can see that I'm not following along any one branch or part of the trunk. I'm bouncing around looking for the shapes of light and dark, um, and then just doing kind of a rough assessment as to whether or not it's aligning in a way that is logical. Uh, and so I'm not... I'm not outlining anything. I'm just blocking in light and shadow shapes. And, and for me, that will help to enhance the idea of light and shadow in the piece as a whole. If I start dropping in line work at, at this point, I could lose that quality. Those lines can then just kind of pop out of the tree. And one of the advantages to using the side of the pencil is that it, um, you know, really always have a sharp point to work with. You're constantly sharpening your pencil. So I haven't had to go back and sharpen my pencil at all through this drawing, and I rarely need to in any drawing. Um, I think what I'm going to do is kind of lift up along that edge a little bit more and then sharpen this. I did that using that overhand grip, but I need to be careful with that. And so I can go darker in some spots, but I want to preserve my darkest darks for just a few key areas. Um, this modified grip that I have here works really well. If you want control, but you still want to use the side of the pencil, you can see how I just wedge it between my fingers here, close my tips around it, um, and then I can flatten it on the side like this. I can roll my wrist to get the, the tip of the pencil activated. So we're going to be using really more the power of suggestion at this point. We don't have to worry about branches all making sense and lining up. Let them break apart is actually more in line with how we observe things. Um, the way we take in the optical information, it comes in more as a sequence of fractured pieces that our brain puts together and understands as a continuous whole, but um, we're largely Again, it's largely a series of broken sections. And I, we can sometimes feel the pressure to make sure everything lines up just perfectly. But you might experiment with different thoughts around that. See what happens if you let these edges just kind of fade in and out or come together and line up in some areas but not in others. Well, I 
like that. All right, so this is requiring a little bit more focus. And I'm, again, I'm not being super precise. My main focus at this point is to think, am I in generally the right spot when I'm making these marks? Uh, that, is my, that is my concern, is mostly about where am I Uh, and as we as we bring sharper edges into to view, then um, they start to stand out against the more atmospheric areas of the drawing. And we get to that curved branch that I'll have to lift out the light of a little bit. Uh, this is the fun part where there's this branch here that's covered in that moss. I love it. So when I get to that moss, I'm going to kind of rotate my wrist so that my pencil is in alignment with the kind of the direction of that, that flow. I'm going to press down and I'm going to kind of move back and forth, rolling the pencil in my fingers. And there's going to be a certain amount of irregularity to the ends there. There we go. And then there's, there's more dark back in here, another patch of moss. And then here with this tree, I'm gonna start kind of from the center of the form, move out to the edge to find that sharper edge. And, and then we, now I become more aware of the, the light that's striking the tree. You know, it's really dark on this side, so I'll bring in a darker pencil. And one of the things I'm going to be testing out soon are the, uh, the Faber-Castell Pit um, matte pencils. So they've made a series of graphite that is does, that has less of that shine to it, which is going to be interesting. And I you know, used a line there to, to define that edge. I just want to make sure that I consume that line with these marks here. Here's where the light's going to be, so I want to be careful there. And I, I think if you, if you break down the shapes in this area into shorter, straighter marks, you might find greater success in, in achieving kind of the, the right character and specific shape. So as I move across here, the shadow on the grass, I'm just giving it these short kind of vertical vibrations as I follow along that horizontal path. There's a shadow that crosses over here. Actually, I'm gonna build that up. And really look at how squished that shadow is. And that's a, this is a really important aspect of the drawing, anchoring the tree to the ground. And we're almost, we're pretty much right at eye level with the base of the tree here. So what that means is all the shapes that we're observing there are largely kind of squished together. And I think it's, it's most important that you make that observation and even if you're off a little bit in the specific shape, um, you can convey that perspective uh, just through the fact that the shapes change and they're really kind of squishing together there. And I'll get that figure in there in a little bit. Okay. Um, 
Uh, Leslie, is, uh, do you have more of a beginner tree study I could start with? I did do a tree study just with the trunk very early on. That's probably two years ago that I did now. Um, I'm trying to think of what this is most similar to. And actually, you know, we did one of a castle not too long ago that you might find valuable in this. Very similar concepts, actually, just less complicated form, but a similar process. So you might check that out. Um, back to here, again, we see these roots as they intersect the ground, largely falling into shadow. All right. I'm going to grab a few more kind of branches in here. So as I as I create these branches too, I'm also kind of allowing the pencil to roll in my fingers to create somewhat irregular marks. What I found, and I think if I were to articulate it, is that by switching to this tripod grip and drawing lines this way, they, when I do them, they feel man-made, they feel less naturally formed, and I think that's why I prefer, um, I prefer to use the side of the pencil. Um, And in here, we've got it. I think if we come across here. And I'm just letting the letting these marks in the trees just kind of lift into the, um, the cluster of leaves. And I think with, with regards to like branches and stuff, less is more. So I think you can the, the, you can just kind of suggest things more, and again, we want the viewer's mind to fill in that information. Um, what I want to do down in here is there's a bit of a shadow that continues over here. Okay, eraser. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're about an hour and a half in. Now I'm going to lift out the light areas on the branches. So using the side of my eraser, so I've got that sharp edge, this is where I'm now targeting the light shapes on those trees, on the branches there. As we come down here, for example, I'm, I'm kind of, again, starting on the center of the form. Starting to lift, looking for the direction of the texture, and then in allowing these marks to just kind of suggest that. As we come across here, there's this branch. So I can use this. You can see I'm rolling it in my fingers there to uh, kind of modulate that form, that shape a little bit. Um, this down in here feels like I need a little bit more, more structure. I didn't really specify this shape very well, so I need to need to hop back in here. So now there are some areas like right in here where the branches are light against the sky that's slightly darker. So this is where having that sharpened eraser can really be helpful. And feel free to let some of these lighter lines degrade, let them break apart in some areas, and it'll, it just conveys the sense that there's like a branch or a leaf in front of it. I 
And then when it gets really, really thin in some of these areas, and it starts to get tricky. You know, break up those pieces. Uh, with these really thin lines, you can often just place that sharp edge on the on the page, give it a little shake, and it can lift a nice fine line. Similar to the texture of hair. And then there's some sections in here where I can come back in on the, the shadow side of these lights and and drop in a bit more. So I'm gonna it, and just kind of roughly indicate these. I don't have to go crazy with with each and every one, but if you want to, you can go right ahead. You know, this is where you your own um, your own instincts and what you're what you're looking for out of the drawing process will take over. So if you're in, in of the mind that you really want that experience of looking closely at these and really getting into the finer details. This is where you can sit with it a little bit more. This is requiring a little bit more focus, so I'm not talking in quite as much, but hopefully it's clear what's happening. If you're a little lost, let me know. And and for me, like if I'm ever stuck, I just squint. <laughs> just squint. When it gets too complicated too complex in a certain area, just squint. That simplifies everything and say, all right, how can I get that basic experience of what I'm seeing when I'm squinting? Lift the light off of that part of the tree, and there's some light striking the branches here. So, for example, right in here, we get this cluster of, of branches that, you know, where we see light striking and things in shadow and I'm just going to try to suggest it. So hopefully then at a distance it all kind of comes together nicely. I kind of I don't know why I just jumped down to this section but I did. I kind of do that. I just going to jump all over the place. So I'm, some of these areas, I'm just letting the eraser kind of do its thing, reacting to the paper, letting it kind of scrub and scrape. Yeah, some really beautiful forms there can get kind of calligraphic with some of these marks too. So this may be a thing too that your work is about. It's about the mark making and maybe you're using the tree just as a jumping off point as a reason to make some of these marks and then you start to let the marks just going to go crazy. Uh, as I'm looking at some of these light areas in the trees, I'm just allowing the, the eraser to scrape along the surface and I'm looking at kind of the, the contour of the tree trying to find that structure. 
Uh, and in particular, where is the light striking a little bit more than in other areas? This is again where we can start to think about the positive and negative spatial relationships between the light and shadow on certain areas of the tree. And then I think we're almost ready for the darkest darks to get in there and add kind of final touches. Uh, And yeah, I don't know what we're drawing next week. And Jane, looks like you want to go to a go to the park. Oh, it can hopefully you can get some time to get out and draw. It's one of the the thing that resets me. I was able to get out and paint over the weekend. I got a couple paintings in, and but I know what you mean. Sometimes it's hard to find that time. That's why we have this show, right? Kind of helps to take a break. All right, there's still more to do on the tree, but I'm gonna kind of distract myself a little bit by uh, working on the, the grassy area here. And I indicate some of the, the grasses just getting a little bit longer on the toward, as we get forward. I'm not putting a whole lot of thought into it, but I'm you know, mostly just thinking about scale, just making smaller marks in the background, um, larger marks as we move forward. And hopefully that, what that does is it starts to convey a sense of that, that distance there, the structural plane. Um, by the way, if anybody is an Artist Network member, we have a really exciting event this month on the 24th. Gustavo Ramos is going to be our Illuminate artist, so we'll have a live event with him, kind of a Q&A with him, and he'll demonstrate a bit of his portrait painting process. So check out Gustavo Ramos's artwork. It is, it is wild. So good. I'm going to suggest these. Um, these fence posts here. Oh, sheep or cow back there? That's interesting. Didn't notice those before. So I, I like this this chisel tip eraser that I made here. Um, it it reminds me a lot of how I might use a brush when I'm painting. Uh, and so, the, and in that way, the the painting, the drawing process helped me to kind of prepare the painting. I'll lift out some light from the the ground here. And then I think I. What I want to do here, I'm going to see what happens if I just play around by kind of inverting the value relationship here. All right, I do want to get to the darkest darks. Where's my, there's my 8B. Uh, now we will get into that. Um, where do I want to do that? I think I want, like right in here, it gets really dark. And so we're going to add more depth to this. If I darken the darks here, that'll hopefully help bring this. 
there goes that sharp point. That'll hopefully bring this, uh, this part of the branch forward. And then maybe back in here, just kind of creating more variety along that tree trunk to give it more form. Right in here, and it gets darker. And I'm just going to kind of enrich some of these darker shapes here to clarify in certain areas. But I want to be selective as I go. I don't want to be too heavy with it across the entire drawing. But I'm trying to think, where do I, where could I benefit from having a little bit more volume, more structure? Now, as we get to the outer edges of the leaves, you can start to add a little bit more refinement. This is where I can kind of be a little more calligraphic with the marks. Uh, and I'm going to, again, be kind of selective with that. I, I don't want to do that across the entire drawing. But it's, you'll find it's amazing how just a few marks here that may not really be all that visible, especially from a distance, can make the whole drawing feel like it's in sharper focus. And in here, it gets a little bit darker to give some more structure to that branch. And I don't know about you, but I could feel that I was calibrating to the value range that I had before. So adding these darks really helps to bring the whole thing together uh, more completely. All right, so now I want to, you know, be thinking about some of these, the edges of the tree more. It was kind of waiting to the very end, but you can see with just a few kind of taps, it starts to bring some, some leaves into view. Um, and I, I might actually find greater success with the uh, slightly lighter pencil. So what I'm, what I'm looking at now are just where I see kind of darker leaves. All right, up here, this is kind of interesting. I'll see what happens if I lift off some light striking those leaves up there. I'm just kind of digging the corner in and rolling that around, creating these irregular marks there. And what I want to avoid is any sort of kind of rhythm to the marks, or consistent pattern, I should say. There's, there can be a rhythm that's irregular, and that's what I want is that irregular rhythm. And then I, think, then I gotta get back in and refine those edges more. All right. So back to the, the 2B, I think this is gonna be the better one. And so as I, as I work my way around, now I can just add a few kind of sharper points here and there to those shapes, and that will help to bring clarity, at least a feeling of clarity to the tree. 
So in this way, and in, in an almost in under two hours, we've been able to create a tree without really drawing every leaf, um, but suggesting more than making explicit. And, you know, I think there's just, I want to be kind of careful, you know, have a, I'll have a few areas where I'll be um, kind of more finished and I'll add a bit more kind of precision to that edge. And, and then another area where I'll just kind of let that fade out. And that will hopefully bring more life to the drawing, I'll kind of accept it more. It's the hard part of when we look at things, you know, only about 1% of our field of vision is actually in focus. But the area that is in focus is what we pay attention to. So then it creates the impression that everything is in sharp focus when it's not. Our brain fills in a lot of that missing information. Uh, and because of that, it freezes up as artists to allow parts of the drawing to just be unfinished out of focus, allow the, allow the viewer's mind to fill that in. Right, because we're really just, we're used to doing that. We do that all the time. We just make stuff up in our brains to satisfy the requirement that our brain has that it makes sense of the world. When you think about it, like it's it's more useful to conceive of the world as being in sharp focus than to conceive of it as being undefined. So that's what our brain puts together for us. So like I said, because of that, we can use that to our advantage as artists and say, hey, well, what if I leave, leave some of these things just unfinished? give just enough suggestion of polish to make them think that the whole thing is like that. And this is where you can kind of use your own reaction to help you decide how much needs to be finished. Where do you, where does your mind go and, and, see things really in sharp clarity in this tree. Maybe finish those areas. Are there other areas that it just kind of looks over? Now, one of the, the big challenges when working with trees is to create a sense of three-dimensional volume, that it's a it's a thing that fills a, a big space. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to focus on light and shadow here. And one of the reasons why being careful around the edges can be so important. Because if we sharpen the, the, the contour of the tree uh, too much, then it can flatten it out. It'll make it feel too much like the silhouette and less like a a three-dimensional form that fills and occupies space. Here, I'm going to sharpen up that negative space so that it brings some of these branches forward more. And I can kind of lift off some of the light on that these branches as well, or on the, the leaves. I think I just need to I need to add a little bit more sharpness down in here to some of these forms. Over here. 
And, you know, I could work on this for another couple hours. And at this point, I don't know as if it would really teach me anything more about the tree. So I, I feel like I'm nearing the end. I feel like I've, I've understood it sufficiently to say, all right, I'm done with the drawing. Um, but again, that's something that is going to be unique to you. It'll be unique to me. When do you feel like you're done? And again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, that when you initiate a drawing, and if you've taken time to think it in ahead about your threshold for accuracy, or expression, et cetera, uh, you'll be able to use that in evaluating whether or not you're, you've reached the end of your drawing journey. Now, if you want to bring a little bit more attention to, say, like this, this branch here, with the light hitting it, you can kind of darken up around it, and that should hopefully pull that out more. And then that branch kind of falls into the shadow of the tree here. All right, and here it. It inverts where we start to see the light sky coming through. So a lot of fun we can have with trees. Uh, so yeah, I don't know what we're going to do next week. So we've done a portrait recently. We did a master copy recently. We got the tree. I think it's time for a still life. So I'm going to look for a still life. I'm probably one in charcoal. Um, let's see. Oh, yes, and yeah, thank you for clarifying that. So the live event with Gustavo, that's if you go to artistnetwork.com uh, slash illuminate, that'll take you to the page that will give you more information. It's also under the members section um, that'll say events there. And we are using uh, uh, Vimeo now, Vimeo Live rather than Zoom. Uh, so it's easier to register, hopefully to access, and it's got all the same features uh, Laura, would you ever teach us a rainforest theme? Yeah, we could do that. Um, that might be a, an idea. Um, thank you, Sina, for comment on my shirt. Uh, let's see. Uh, Wilma's saying two big keys, really seeing what you render and then getting the values right. I have much to learn about both of those concepts. We all do. And that's, that's the thing about you know, art in general um, is that it's not a linear progression in the idea that you learn fundamentals and then you kind of abandon them, right? You move, move beyond them, I should say. What happens is that as you, as you challenge yourself and as, you, as, you, as you, you push the subject matter more, what you do is you, you understand those fundamentals in a more expansive way. Um, and that's really why I think the objective of refining your practice and building the habit of a healthy practice is so valuable um, because you understand things like value, shape, line, form, and texture just with increasing depth and, and, and more expansiveness. So um, we, all, we all have you know, a lifetime of learning of all these concepts ahead of us. And we're going to be at different stages in those journeys. But if you can, if you can establish a healthy practice, then you, you get to that. And a lot of that requires being comfortable with doing work just with, with the intention of, of growing and, and failing, experimenting and, and pushing things there's going to be times when you need to execute as an artist. You just need to make a good painting or good drawing, whether it's part of a commission or a show. Um, but really, the the grunt work that artists put into your, their practice is to fail, um, in a in hopefully in a way that, that that I'm describing as beneficial failure, right? Um, I don't I don't think that's the optimal word, but that's the one that comes to mind. But you know, it's often we learn. 
how to really manage and push the boundaries of a material when we see beyond its limitations and when we when we push when we push beyond the desire to control it right um that's when innovative things start to happen in in mediums uh, and it can be a very vulnerable and difficult thing and so if you need to do that in the privacy of your own studio go for it um, but you know we we, it's often in how things break that we discover their new possibilities. How can I do? How can I draw wrong? <laughs> right? How can I make? How can I use the charcoal in an incorrect way? Uh, you, when you approach it like that, then you start to discover new things that could become part of your your path as an artist. Uh, I am having a hard time putting this down because I, I just keep. Getting sucked into it. Oh my gosh, I forgot the guy. The whole thing. I gotta put the guy in. Here, figure. We're gonna do this quickly because that's the best way to incorporate a figure. If you labor on it, I found that it ultimately just becomes clumsy. Having said that, if you need to labor on the, on the figure, go for it. Just keep going for it. Um, I just wanted to kind of describe my process for it. Um, oh, JC, uh, Jackie, haven't done hands, feet, arms, et cetera, in a long time. That's a, good, uh, that's a good point as well. We haven't really done more of a figure, so let me check on that. Okay, the figure, I'm not going to do linearly. Um, the, I'm, I want to really kind of focus on the gesture so I can make a, just a side mark here to represent the, the head. And I want to get the slope of the shoulders right. All right, so I'm kind of breaking that up. Slope of the shoulders is critical. There is a kind of a vertical, not a vertical, but a, an angled line that we can use to represent the back leg. And then the arm comes down on top of it. And we see this coat that comes in on top of that. And then we see a different kind of gesture for the, there we see the front arm and the leg that's bent. And he's a little bit, a little bit slopey. He's, he's really leaning into that tree a bit. I can straighten that out. So approach it as a shape, as shapes there, and I think you can, you can achieve quite a bit. And like I said, a lot of it just hinges on the shoulder. Get the shoulders right, and so much of the figure will kind of fall in place. Um, so I didn't quite get that 100% accurately compared to the reference, but that's okay. He kind of provides that scale. Maybe he's a little kind of chunkier than in the... Uh, in the reference, I can cut that back down. Make him leaner. There you go, I feel like that's a kind of a stronger, stronger figure there. Uh, but the big thing is to, you know, again, focus on the scale. What I'm looking at is the relationship of his head to this knot. And of course, then you have the ground plane where that, that he, he kind of passes into that shadow. So, um, so hopefully that's helpful. Uh, there's still more I could do in the grass, but I kind of like the idea of this being unfinished and more attention being brought into the tree. Um, oh, a panda. Pandas, that'd be a lot of fun. My daughter is really into the red pandas now. Um, though, so those, uh, it's great suggestions. Um, thank you, Nia and Leslie for monitoring the chat for me and clearing some of the uh, the unwanted chatter. 
Um, I want to thank you all for joining me today. I'll hang out for a few seconds to see if there are any other lingering questions. Um, but let me switch back here. So again, thank you for joining me. Join me next Wednesday, again at 3 p.m. Eastern, for the next Drawing Together. Um, I'm going to take some of these suggestions for uh, images. It's certainly under consideration because I need some ideas. Um, we'll, we'll figure that out. So I'll be posting that later this week. Um, and I'm open to any other uh, thoughts, suggestions about what you'd like to see here on this YouTube channel in, in general as well. Don't forget to share your work on artistnetwork.com. Check out artistnetwork.com slash illuminate for the upcoming event on our Vimeo Live. It's uh, going to be featuring Gustavo Ramos. Uh, that's for our members. Um, and if you want to attend um, but you're not a member, uh, you can join and you get the first week free. And then you can always cancel as well if you need to from there. But I think once you join, you're going to like it. Uh, we try to do these Illuminate events each month, and they're a lot of fun. So again, thank you all for joining me. It has been a blast. I look forward to seeing your own trees. 